Welcome to Twists and Turns in Teaching Evolution with Glenn Branch of the National Center for Science and Education. Today I'm going to be talking today about twists and turns in, the, in teaching evolution with a special emphasis, as far as I can manage it, on what humanists might need and want to know about evolution education in the United States. Next slide, please. It's a closely guarded secret but there's a special prize for the most obvious comment offered at the AHA meeting. Here's my submission for the well duh award that scientists overwhelmingly accept evolution. About 98% of US scientists, according to a 2015 survey, while the US public is not quite so squared away, only 65% of them in the same survey. Next slide. What's the reason for the disconnect? In a book review published in the New York Times in 1989, a well-known scientist offered a handful of possible diagnoses saying, quote, if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. But he didn't attempt to test these competing hypotheses. Next slide. They can be tested, however. In a 2012 US survey, for example, the common ancestry of humans and other animals was accepted by only 48% of respondents. But the claim that the theory of evolution involves the common ancestry of humans and other animals was accepted by 72% of respondents. To understand what's going on here, let's look at the cross tabs. Next slide, please. Slightly more than half of the evolution deniers lacked even a minimal understanding of evolution insofar as they didn't agree that the theory of evolution involves the common ancestry of humans and other animals. And slightly less than half of the evolution deniers rejected evolution while displaying at least this minimal understanding of what it in fact involves. Next slide, please. So about half of our evolution deniers are clearly ignorant. Is it plausible though that the other half, about a quarter of the US population, are stupid, insane, or wicked. That would be rather disturbing if so. But there's a neglected alternative. Someone can understand evolution, yet reject it, if they're in the grips of an ideology that prevents them from accepting it. Next slide, please. What could such an ideology be? Something religious in nature, sure, but we can be more exact than that. Evolution denial is largely driven by inerrantism, the view that the Bible is without error in all it teaches, including not only matters of faith and morals, but also matters of history and science. And hey, about a quarter of the US population reports taking an inerrantist view. Next slide, please. Inerrantists can and do disagree about what the Bible in fact teaches. Every view to the Northwest of theistic evolution on this chart is basically an inerrantist position and they differ greatly in what they claim. But they all agree that God separately created living things after their own kind, meaning that evolution between kinds, whatever they are, is impossible. Next slide, please. Now, in a liberal, diverse, cosmopolitan society, we tolerate people having ideologies that we don't share or even deplore, so long as they don't attempt them to impose them on others or otherwise to interfere with their legitimate interests. This is a statue of tolerance in a park in Brno in the Czech Republic. Next slide, please. But in the case of inerrancy driven evolution denial, creationism, there's been a long and inglorious history of such attempts in the US. If you traveled a century back in time to July, 1921, what could you expect to encounter besides complaints from the physicists? You wouldn't find any controversies over the teaching of evolution, but you'd find that the conditions were ripe. Next slide, please. In 1921, after all, the Great War was still fresh in people's memory, thanks in part to a Stanford biologist, Vernon Kellogg, who reported from the front that a German colleague had told him that the war was a manifestation of the Darwinian struggle for existence. Evolution was popularly associated in the American mind with German militarism and the horrors of the ensuing war. Next slide, please. Also in 1921, a struggle for the control of Protestant denominations in the US was escalating. 
modernists were prevailing. So the fundamentalists had organized under that name and published a series of pamphlets, the fundamentals, 1910 to 1915, to articulate their position and stake out their claims. Not all of these were anti-evolution, but fundamentalism soon hardened into creationism. Next slide, please. And in 1921, American public education was in the process of broadening. Many students, particularly in rural areas, were now learning more than just read and write in and arithmetic with books like Hunter's Civic Biology, which included the concept of evolution being used in the classroom. And many parents didn't welcome this broadening of their children's horizons. Next slide, please. The result, representing the first of three waves of anti-evolutionism in the United States that we'll be looking at, was a crusade to ban the teaching of evolution in America's public schools. The first proposed bill to do so in Kentucky failed to win passage in the state's legislature in 1922, thanks in part to the lobbying of scientists at the University of Kentucky. Next slide. In 1925, a similar bill called the Butler Act after its sponsor, John Washington Butler, passed the Tennessee legislature and was signed into law. The new law made it illegal to teach in a state-supported school, quote, any teach theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Next slide. The American Civil Liberties Union, then just a baby organization, wanted to organize a legal challenge to the Butler Act and sought a teacher willing to be the defendant in a test case. This is from the Chattanooga Daily Times. The publicity came to the attention of a group of businessmen in Dayton, Tennessee, who saw an opportunity to attract attention to their town. Next slide. And they recruited John Thomas Scopes. A fresh college graduate, Scopes was teaching general science and coaching a little football in Dayton to save up money to pursue further studies. He didn't approve of the Butler Act. He had seen his professors in Kentucky fight against the 1922 bill there. So he agreed to be the defendant in what would be Tennessee v. Scopes. Next slide, please. Scopes was at, as he entitled his memoir, the center of the storm. Representing him at trial was the most famous defense lawyer of his day, Clarence Darrow, bottom left, although he wasn't the only member of the defense team. There was also the famously erratic and slovenly John Randolph Neal, the great orator Dudley Field Malone, and Arthur Garfield Hayes of the ACLU. Next slide, please. Likewise, although he wasn't the only member of the prosecution team, William Jennings Bryan got the headlines. A three-time Democratic presidential candidate and former Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson, Bryan became involved in the anti-evolution crusade on his retirement, lobbying to get anti-evolution legislation passed in states across the country. Next slide, please. Bryan made headlines just by serving on the prosecution team, but he made even more headlines when he agreed to Darrow's request, a highly unusual request, to testify at the Scopes trial as an expert on the Bible. The resulting examination was devastating, at least as far as the big city reporters were concerned. Brian came across as both ignorant and complacent. Next slide, please. But what mattered, of course, was the reaction of the jury. What would their verdict be? The jury decided that Scopes had indeed violated the Butler Act. The judge imposed a fine of $100, and that was that. Well, in fact, that wasn't that. The defense team halfway expected to lose the trial all along and conducted its case in the hope of winning an eventual decision on appeal. Next slide. The verdict was duly appealed to the Tennessee Supreme Court, this happy-go-lucky crew, which overturned Scope's conviction, but on a technicality. There was no ruling on the law itself. The court was clearly trying to avoid further embarrassment for the states, writing, Quote, we see nothing to be gained by prolonging the life of this bizarre case. The Butler Act remained on the books. Next slide. Bryan died soon after the trial, and only two other states, Arkansas and Mississippi, enacted bans on teaching evolution. Yet evolution went into educational abeyance. Textbook publishers started to downplay evolution and a national survey of high school biology teachers conducted in 1939-1940 revealed, next slide, that only about 54% were teaching evolution as a central principle of biology. Even some of these teachers 
were still, excuse me, still steering clear of human evolution, which was the main focus of the Scopes era legislation like the Butler Act. And so only about 51% were teaching evolution without compromise. Next slide. I should mention that the lead researcher on the survey, Oscar Riddle, 1877 to 1968, was not only a distinguished biologist who was deeply concerned about helping teachers resist the anti-evolutionary pressure of dogmatic religious groups, as his biographer put it, but also a staunch humanist, receiving the AHA's Humanist of the Year Award in 1958. Next slide, please. A hit Broadway play in 1955 and the film adaptation in 1960 brought the Butler Act back into the public eye. As the tagline, it's all about the fabulous monkey trial that rocked America indicates, the producers were happy enough to convey the impression that Inherit the Wind was a documentary about the Scopes trial, though it wasn't. Next slide. What really brought evolution back into the public schools was a polished metal sphere, 23 inches in diameter. Sputnik, the first artificial satellite launched by the Soviet Union in 1957. Fearing a loss in the space race, the US federal government poured funds into improving science, which included science education, which included biology, which included evolution. Next slide, please. In Little Rock, Arkansas in 1965, a teacher named Susan Epperson was told by her school to teach from a textbook that had been revised to include evolution which would force her to violate the Scopes era ban. She sued the state and the case wound its way to the Supreme Court, which in 1968 ruled that the ban violated the first amendment to the US constitution. Next slide, please. Scopes was still around, I'm pleased to say, and he welcomed the decision striking down the bans on evolution, telling the Associated Press that as far as he was concerned, the decision came 43 years too late. The following year, he and Susan Epperson had lunch together in Shreveport, Louisiana, where he re was retired. Scopes died the next year in 1970. Next slide. With evolution back in the textbooks and in the classrooms, and with legal barriers to its teaching falling under legal challenge or being repealed, the stage was set for the second wave of anti-evolution activity. It no longer being possible to ban the teaching of evolution in the public schools, the creationists instead attempted to balance the teaching of evolution. With what? Next slide, please. In the first instance, the Bible. This fellow was Russell Artist, born in 1911 and died in 2000. So that's, I guess, a portrait of Artist as a young man. Artist was a biology teacher at a religious college a member of the Creation Research Society, a pseudo-scholarly group of creationists, and a co-author of the creationist textbook Seen to the Right There, published in 1970. Next slide. The Tennessee State Textbook Commission wouldn't adopt such textbooks for use in the state's public schools. So at artists urging, the Tennessee legislature passed a law in 1973 requiring that textbooks that discuss evolution represented as a theory, not a fact, and give an equal amount of attention to other theories, including but not limited to the Genesis account in the Bible. Next slide, please. The law was challenged in federal court in Daniel V. Waters, Joe Daniel, seen here, was a zoology professor at the University of Tennessee, and Hugh Waters was the chair of the textbook commission. The court ruled that the law violated the constitutional guarantee of separation of church and state, in part because it gave a preferential position to the Bible, next slide, and in part because it explicitly provided that occult or satanic theories were not protected, further indicating the law's religious motivations and effect. There's a well-known engraving by Gustave Doré. Some say that it shows the fall of Satan from heaven as imagined in Paradise Lost, but I think it shows him being banished from Tennessee, probably to Alabama. Next slide, please. So much for balancing evolution with biblical creationism. Creationists then attempted to balance evolution with something called creation science, or sometimes scientific creationism. So what is creation science? In content, it's probably what you think of when you think of creationism, since it's now the dominant form of creationism in the United States. Next slide, please. Creation science claims that the universe and the earth are thousands, not billions of years old, that living things were created by God to reproduce after their own kind, so evolution across kinds is impossible, 
and that Noah's flood was a historic global event resulting in a narrow genetic bottleneck among land vertebrates, most of the fossil record, and major geological features like the Grand Canyon. Next slide, please. This secularization of biblical creationism was influential. In the late 1970s and the early 1980s, there were attempts in literally dozens of states to require equal time for creation science. Two bills, one in Arkansas and one in Louisiana, were enacted, both in 1981. The Arkansas law was ruled unconstitutional in a landmark trial, McLean versus Arkansas, 1982. Next slide, please. One reason I describe McLean as a landmark trial is that it is one of only two trials over the teaching of evolution that involved testimony from expert witnesses. Among the plaintiff's expert witnesses was the Harvard paleontologist, Stephen Jay Gould, who was honored with the AHA's Humanist of the Year Award in 2001, the year before his untimely death. Next slide, please. Arkansas's law was vulnerable because it was so specific. I won't read all these provisions, but it discussed creation ex nihilo from nothing, evolution only within kinds, a worldwide flood, a young earth. But Louisiana's law defined creation science as the scientific evidences for creation and inferences from those scientific evidences without ever saying what they were. Next slide. Louisiana's law and Arkansas's law had a common ancestor in a model equal time bill adapted from a model school board policy drafted by the Institute for Creation Research. But the day on which the age of the earth and a global flood and all that were stripped for, by the Louisiana legislature from the bill, May 28th, 1981, was the very next day after McLean versus Arkansas was filed in court. Next slide. It seems clear that the proponents of creation science were worried that it wouldn't survive constitutional scrutiny. The Institute for Creation Research declined to participate in the Arkansas trial, but it hoped and worked for success in the Louisiana trial, even managing to get its own staff attorney appointed as a special state assistant attorney general for the case. Next slide, please. Yet the comparative reticence of Louisiana's law didn't help it. When the challenge to it finally reached the Supreme Court, the ruling in Edwards v. Aguilard was, quote, the act impermissibly endorses religion by advancing the religious belief that a supernatural being created humankind. That's the lead plaintiff, Donald Aguilard there, standing next to Susan Epperson. Next slide, please. The decision notwithstanding, legislators still introduced bills aimed at inserting creationism in the public school science classroom. In 2021, this year, Mary Bentley in Arkansas sought to allow teachers to teach creationism, quote, as a theory of how the earth came to exist, which it isn't. Still, her bill passed the House before being defeated on the narrowest of votes, three to three, in a Senate committee. Next slide, please. After Edwards, the idea still beckoned of further disinfecting creationism of its overtly religious content. Thus, in the third instance of the strategy of balancing the teaching of evolution with something else, something called intelligent design was concocted and promoted by people like Michael Behe, a biochemist at Lehigh University, and books like Of Pandas and People. Next slide. Intelligent design is all about finding something that can be billed as a scientific alternative to evolution that will survive constitutional scrutiny. So its proponents deny that their view entails any particular conception of the designer. It could be God, they acknowledge, but it could equally be aliens from outer space or perhaps time travelers from the far future. Next slide, please. Similarly, the intelligent design movement strives to maintain a big tent under which all anti-evolutionists are welcome to shelter, including young earth creationists, old earth creationists, ultra-Orthodox Jewish creationists, Islamic creationists, Hare Krishna creationists taking their cues from Hindu scriptures, Native American creationists, and New Age creationists. Next slide. About the only anti-evolution group unwelcome to shelter under Intelligent Design's big tent has been a clone-crazed alien-worshipping free love UFO cult run by a former race car driver, the Ray Aliens, whose public announcement of support for teaching intelligent design in the public schools was met with a stony silence, but their exclusion from the big tent seems only tactical. 
Next slide, please. So the intelligent design movement takes no official position on the issues that divide anti-evolutionists. Maybe the earth is 4.5 billion years old. Maybe it's 6,000 years old. Maybe as with the Hare Krishna creationists, it's trillions of years old. Likewise for common descent, likewise for Noah's flood, whatever you like, as long as you reject evolution. Next slide. Intelligent design is highly noncommittal. Somewhere, at some point in time, some intelligent agent somehow did something for some reason to affect the history of life, somehow. Yet, given that most students in US public school science classes will have antecedent notions about where, when, who, how, what, and why, the upshot of teaching intelligent design is clear. Next slide. Despite the protestations and pretensions of its advocates to be interested in a rigorous scientific endeavor, the primary target of intelligent design was the public schools. Of Pandas and People, shown here again, is the first book to use the phrase intelligent design in this specific sense, and it was intended and marketed for use as a supplementary high school biology textbook. Next slide, please. In its attempt to target public schools, however, intelligent design received a serious setback in 2005. In Dover, Pennsylvania, in 2004, the local school board was quarreling over biology textbooks, with one board member complaining that the standard textbooks were laced with Darwinism and seeking to have of pandas and people adopted. Next slide, please. In the resultant fracas, the board formulated and voted to adopt a policy requiring that, quote, students will be made aware of gaps slash problems in Darwin's theory and of other theories of evolution, including but not limited to intelligent design. This was the first formal school policy in the country requiring the teaching of intelligent design. Next slide, please. This policy was implemented as a requirement that a four paragraph disclaimer about evolution be read aloud to students. The teachers refused and administrators had to do it. The disclaimer commended of pandas and people to the attention of the students. There were enough copies to go around since as yet anonymous citizens had donated dozens of copies to the school. Next slide, please. 11 local parents filed suit. The case was dubbed Kitzmiller v. Dover. The plaintiff's legal team decided to have Tammy Kitzmiller as the lead plaintiff, in part because she had a child in the ninth grade biology class, so could claim to be in imminent danger of being harmed by the policy and the disclaimer, and in part because they took a shine to her Pennsylvania Dutch surname. Next slide, please. Representing the board was the religious right Thomas More Law Center. The Discovery Institute, the de facto and institutional headquarters of intelligent design was going to participate, but they squabbled with the Thomas More folks. Various bigwigs of the intelligent design movement were slated to testify, although two of the three most important withdrew after the squabble. Next slide, please. Representing the 11 parents were the ACLU of Pennsylvania, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and a private law firm, Pepper Hamilton. The National Center for Science Education consulted throughout devoting untold hours to the case. And the expert witnesses, which we recruited, included three members of our board of directors. Next slide, please. I'll note that Barbara Forrest, one of those expert witnesses, received AHA's Humanist Pioneer Award in 2009, while NCSE's executive director then, Eugenie C. Scott, received AHA's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014. I think, in fact, that she's here today. Hi, Jeannie. And, spoiler, the judge presiding over the case received HA's Humanist Religious Liberty Award in 2008. Next slide, please. After a trial taking place over a biblical 40 days with extensive expert testimony, the Kitzmiller decision came. The judge, a Republican, churchgoer, and George W. Bush appointee, found that the school district's policy violated the Constitution because intelligent design represents a religious belief. His decision was issued on December 20th, 2005. So for the plaintiffs, it was a Merry Kitzmas. Next slide, please. That wasn't the end of intelligent design to be sure. True, legislators in Indiana and Utah who had promised to introduce intelligent design legislation abandoned those efforts after the Kitzmiller decision. Yet as late as 2013, for example, there was a bill in Missouri 
that would have required equal time for intelligent design in that state's public schools. Next slide, please. But despite the trend toward more and more secular seeming forms of creationism, biblical creationism, creation science, intelligent design, with which to balance the teaching of evolution, intelligent design has got to be the end of the line as far as that strategy is concerned, as the cartoonist Tom Tolles observes. You just can't get vaguer and more non-committal. Next slide, please. That's why we're now in, and have been for about the last 19 years, actually, as I would date it, the third wave of anti-evolutionism in the United States. Now, it no longer being possible to establish formal policies banning or balancing the teaching of evolution, it's necessary for creationists to try to establish formal policies belittling evolution. It has to begin with a B. Next slide, please. Catchphrases associated with this third wave include theory, not fact, teach the controversy, academic freedom, evidence for and against, strengths and weaknesses, critical analysis, and so tediously on. All of these appeal to enlightenment values, but are used in the service of a rather darker agenda. Next slide, please. I'm not claiming that these are new catchphrases or that this is a new strategy. What's new is using such phrases in the absence of references to supposed alternatives to evolution. Creationists have always had such phrases in their arsenal of arguments aimed at undermining the teaching of evolution. What's new is now that they have nothing else, or at least nothing as reliable. Next slide, please. Within this wave of anti-evolution activity, in which the emphasis is on belittling evolution, there have in turn been two approaches. The first was to require teachers to belittle evolution. For example, Florida's Senate Bill 1854 from 2011, which wanted schools to provide, quote, a thorough presentation and critical analysis of the scientific theory of evolution. Next slide, please. That might sound good, until you realize that critical analysis is here code for criticism. The sponsor of the bill had previously described his bill as one that would require the teaching of intelligent design, explaining if you're going to teach evolution, then you have to teach the other side so that you can have critical thinking. Fortunately, this bill died. Next slide, please. More popular has been the second approach within the belittling strategy involving bills that do not require but instead permit something to be taught, often under the rubric of academic freedom. In fact, there have been about 80 academic freedom bills introduced since 2004, with three, unfortunately, being enacted. Next slide, please. Both amusing and ironic is the fact that a former colleague of mine, Nick Matsky, who worked on the Kitzmiller trial, managed to get a publication in the journal Science by applying state-of-the-art phylogenetic methods that is evolutionary methods, to the text of these anti-evolution bills to re reveal their genealogical relationships. Since it was published right around the 10th anniversary of the Kitzmiller decision, I call this Matsky's Kitzmistry. Next slide, please. The three academic freedom bills that were passed were in Mississippi in 2006, Louisiana in 2008, and Tennessee in 2012. Let's take a look at the most recent which was enacted despite a massive protest from Tennessee's scientific and education communities. Governor Bill Haslam allowed the bill to become law, albeit without his signature. Next slide. Here's the key provision of the statute. What this says is that when it comes to the scientific strengths and scientific weaknesses of the theories covered in the state science standards, teachers are basically free to do anything they want to help students quote, understand, analyze, critique, and review in an objective manner those strengths and weaknesses, free from any oversight. Next slide, please. Since none of these terms is defined and no way to adjudicate among competing definitions of them is offered, the law in effect allows scientific teachers with, let's say, idiosyncratic scientific opinions to teach anything they please so long as they claim with a straight face that they're helping the students by doing so. What might such idiosyncratic scientific opinions be? Next slide. Earlier versions of the bill cited the chemical origins of life, global warming, and human cloning, as well as evolution. But it seems clear that legislative support was based on the percept 
perception that the bill would empower and embolden teachers to present creationism in one form or another in their science classrooms. Not for nothing was it nicknamed the monkey bill. Next slide, please. My pal, the magnificently bearded Michael Cohen, who wrote his doctoral dissertation at Vanderbilt on evolution education in Tennessee circa 2009-2012, told a local newspaper when the law was passed that lots of Tennessee teachers were already teaching creationism and that it was likely teachers would understand the law as allowing them to do so. Next slide, please. Indeed, a rigorous national survey of public high school biology teachers conducted in 2007 revealed that about 16%, one in six, were themselves creationists agreeing that God created human beings in their present form at one time within the last 10,000 years or so. And about 13%, one in eight, were presenting creationism as scientifically credible in their classrooms. Next slide, please. But there's more. The law is also profoundly anti-democratic. As matters stand, in the United States, public education is ultimately under democratic control. The people vote for representatives at the local, state, and federal level, who then set policy that is enacted by administrators who all wear hats and carry briefcases through managing classroom teachers. Next slide, please. But the academic freedom anti-evolution bills, by prohibiting administrators from reining in rogue teachers, would make public school teachers unaccountable to the public. And again, one in eight public high school biology teachers was already teaching creationism as scientifically credible. How much worse would the situation be if these bills were widely enacted? Next slide, please. A newer battlefield emerged about 30 years ago, state science standards, which specify what students in the state's public schools are expected to learn. Standards thus influence the content of textbooks, statewide testing, and coursework for pre-service and in-service teachers. Importantly, they also provide a shield for teachers facing misguided community pressure. Next slide, please. Creationists have tried to use standards to undermine the teaching of evolution. For example, in 1995, the Alabama State Board of Education inserted a provision in the state science standards that required evolution not to be presented dogmatically, and then invoked that provision to require a disclaimer about evolution to be affixed to all biology textbooks used in the state's public schools. Next slide, please. Standards are increasingly important, and as a result, battles over the place of evolution and standards have been frequent. In the last decade, they've occurred in Arizona, Florida, Iowa, Kansas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Texas, and I might have forgotten a few. Creationists have been on the losing side of these battles generally, but not entirely. Next slide, please. But even where there hasn't been such battles, there's no reason for complacency. In 2009, two of my colleagues assessed the treatment of evolution in state science standards. The states marked with the darker colors were doing worse. There have been some changes in the last 12 years though, most of them, I'm pleased to say, for the better. Next slide, please. The biggest development in state science standards in the last 10 years was the release of the Next Generation Science Standards, NGSS, in 2013. These are a model set of standards developed by a consortium of a bunch of nonprofit organizations and 26 states using up-to-date science and equally up-to-date pedagogy. Next slide, please. The NGSS highlight by biological evolution, unity and diversity as a disciplinary core idea of the life sciences at the middle and high school levels. By now, 20 states plus the District of Columbia have adopted the NGSS and a further 24 states have adopted standards based on the same evolution friendly framework on which the NGSS are based. Next slide, please. Yet the decentralization of American education makes it hard to know for sure how extensively and how well evolution is being taught. In many biology classes, evolution takes a back seat, as the New York Times reminds us. Origins of species, in many schools, the dog ate that chapter. Anecdotes and impressions are rife, but fortunately there's data too. Next slide, please. 
In 2019, one of the researchers from the 2007 survey I mentioned before and staff from NCSC collaborated on a partial replication of that 2007 survey. And we published a report on it about a year ago in June, 2020 in the journal Evolution, Education and Outreach. There are the proud parents, Eric Plutzer of Penn State, me and my colleague, Anne Reed. Next slide, please. In the 2019 survey, we classified teachers according to whether they emphasized the broad scientific consensus on evolution and whether they emphasized creationism as a valid scientific alternative to evolution. The result was four categories that are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Teachers who present evolution as settled science with mixed messages, avoiding, avoidance, and creationism advocacy. Next slide, please. Reanalyzing the data from the 2007 survey, we found that a slim majority of teachers, 51%, was presenting evolution as settled science. But remember that the Riddle survey from 1939-1940 found that only 51% of teachers was presenting evolution as a central principle of biology. 51%, 51%. Does that mean that there was no progress at all in US evolution education in 67 years? Next slide. Probably not. The Riddle survey had a sampling bias and a response bias that makes it likely that teachers who presented evolution as a central principle of biology were overrepresented. And the questions used in the two survey aren't exactly comparable. Moreover, these questions only measure a small part of what makes for a good or bad evolution education. But still, yikes. Next slide, please. When we compare the 2007 and the 2019 surveys though, there was progress. From 51% of high school biology teachers reporting endorsing evolution and not creationism in 2007 to 67% in 2019. This was matched by drops in teachers endorsing both evolution and creationism, avoiding endorsing either, and endorsing creationism without endorsing evolution. Next slide, please. What accounts for the difference? Since NCSC, where I work, was intimately involved in the Kitzmiller case of 2005, having put together the legal team representing the plaintiffs, provided the expert witnesses, including three members of our board of directors, and supported the legal team throughout the case, it would be nice to think that the sweeping legal victory played a role. Next slide, please. Alas, the evidence doesn't point that way. In 2003, Randy Moore administered a questionnaire about the legal issues over teaching evolution and creationism in the public schools to a convenient sample of Minnesota high school biology teachers. And he found that a large majority was already aware that it's unconstitutional to teach creationism in the public schools. Next slide, please. While a variety of explanations are possible, we found that teachers in NGSS states reported having taken more pre-service and in-service coursework in evolution than their colleagues elsewhere. These are pre-service teachers at Cornell University. So this suggests that the increased expectations of the next generation science standards impelled both novice and veteran teachers to upgrade their content knowledge of evolution. Next slide, please. Prediction is uncertain especially about the future, but let me offer a three-part forecast. First, we're not going to see any significant anti-evolution policy enacted, whether in the form of legislation or in, in attacks on standards. Even if such a policy is enacted, as it might be in Arkansas in 2022, judging from the near miss in 2021, it won't endure for long. Next slide, please. Second, it's gonna be a long time until the evolution wars at end, owing to the decentralization of American education. With 13,500 odd local school districts having primary responsibility for curriculum and instruction, these are the district boundaries in the lower 48, improvements in, evolu ev improvements in evolution education are inevitably going to be slow, scattered, and incremental. Next slide, please. But third and finally, the signs for the long-term are promising. Look at this graph of American public opinion on evolution over the last 35 years. The gray shading indicates the 99% confidence interval. Thus 2022 next year will mark a full decade through which we can be confident that acceptance of evolution is more common among the American public than rejection. Next slide, please. 
There are two basic approaches to improving public acceptance and understanding of evolution, corresponding to ignorance and ideology. First, increasing the amount and quality of teacher coursework in evolution and pedagogical methods for teaching evolution effectively. And we've already seen how improvements in state science standards in the US can induce such increases. Next slide, please. AHA and its members have been supporting such efforts. Let me give a shout out here to Jason Wiles of Syracuse University. Hi, Jason. A new member of AHA's board of directors whose research on evolution education, as well as his efforts to resist creationists in his home state of Arkansas, recently won him a Friend of Darwin Award from NCSE. Next slide, please. The second approach to improving public understanding and acceptance of evolution involves the ideologies that stand in the way of teaching evolution, sometimes carrying signs. Of course, it's neither possible nor desirable to try to directly change the ideologies of teachers, parents, and members of the community who harbor ideological reservations about evolution. Next slide, please. But it is possible to make evolution less threatening to such people. For example, by showing them that there are people who share their values yet accept the science, such as Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health and an evangelical Christian who accepts evolution, or Kenneth R. Miller, the co-author of a popular series of high school biology textbooks and a Catholic who accepts evolution. Next slide. But a different approach, and one more suited to a secularist group like AHA, is to make evolution less threatening by appealing to widely shared values that are neither religious nor anti-religious, showing that learning about evolution can be interesting and exciting, and most important of all, accompanied by scrumptious cake. Next slide, please. In 1993, Robert Stevens, another NCSC Friend of Darwin Award recipient, saw the need for a sustained outreach effort to demonstrate widespread acceptance of evolution and support of evolution, evolution education. And Darwin Day celebrations, often, often a featuring birthday cake, have become a fixture across the country and around the globe, thanks in large part to AHA's role in coordinating and publicizing it. Next slide, please. But you don't have to wait for February 12th. For members of the AHA and members of the NCSC alike, every day can be and should be Darwin Day, a chance to promote public understanding and acceptance of evolution. Thanks for your interest and your attention. Thank you so much, Glenn. Uh, that was very informative. Um, first, I should tell you that um, both uh, Eugenie Scott and Jason Wiles responded to your hellos in the chat with hellos of their own. So um, they are both here and, uh, and welcomed the shout outs. Um, first question, since you mentioned it right at the end um, there, uh, there's Darwin Day, uh, February 12th and Evolution Day, November 24th. Are there, uh, lots of humanist groups like to celebrate them as humanist holidays. Do you have suggestions for events or ways that they it can be celebrated or ways that groups are celebrating them around the country? One of the great things about Darwin Day is the, um, the creativity of the local groups that have been engaging in it. No one has, I think, developed a template that groups have to follow. Um, and people have come up with innovative ideas. Uh, many organizations like to have speakers in, um, which is very traditional. Some um, do excursions to natural history museums or uh, parks or zoos and that kind of thing. Uh, several places have set up permanent or temporary geological walks where you mark off a distance and then corresponding to the history of the uh, earth. So the beginning is 4.5 billion years ago and you walk your way to the modern day with uh, informative signs on the way. And there are several, as I say, permanent and temporary installations about this, but there, there's certainly more innovative and clever ideas than I can do justice to. Um, thank you. Uh, it, it, Pete Anderson is asking, can you suggest some references um, to help people with responses to uh, intelligent design? 
Well, it kind of depends on what context you encounter it in. in. Um, there are several good books, one edited by uh, Petto and Godfrey called Scientists Confront Creationism, Intelligent Design and Beyond. Another is called Why Intelligent Design Fails, edited by Tanner Edis and Matt Young. Both of these have probably more than you want to know about um, what's wrong with intelligent design. Uh, there are also various good um, resources on the web and blogs. The Pandas Thumb, pandasthumb.org, is a uh, active and entertaining blog that has a lot of refutations of intelligent design and also um, older forms of creationism. And of course, well, I should mention NCSE's website, ncse.ngo. Um, one of the questioners has reminded me that you posted a poll, um, and you're supposed to tell us the answer. The poll asked, which country music star has a surprising connection to the Scopes trial of 1925? And um, for those of you who aren't looking at the poll, of the people who answered, 34% think it's Dolly Parton. 31% think it's Johnny Cash, 11% went with Reba McIntyre, 17% said Willie Nelson, and 7% said Kenny Rogers. Okay, I, I put this in for fun, so I hope it is fun. Uh, the Johnny Cash folks have it. So Yay, that was my answer. <laughs> So here's the story. Uh, almost 44 years after the Scopes trial in uh, February 1969, Johnny Cash played a live gig at San Quentin State Prison in California. And there he debuted a new song, more of a novelty song than a country number called A Boy Named Sue. As you recall, the, story tells us, the, the song tells the story of a boy who was named Sue and then abandoned by his father. With such a feminine name, he found life ain't easy for a boy named Sue. Eventually he meets, fights, and is reconciled with his father who tells him that Sue is the name that helped make you strong. And the singer concludes, if I ever have a son, I think I'm going to name him Bill or George, anything but Sue. Now the song was a huge hit for Cash, his biggest hit on the Billboard Hot 100 and his only top 10 single there, spending three weeks at number two. And that must have come as a surprise because he didn't write it and in fact, wasn't all that familiar with it. If you look at the film on the, of the concert, you can see him looking down at a scrap of paper for the lyrics. In fact, Cash had received the song a few days before at a party by its author, the cartoonist and poet Shel Silverstein. As the story goes, the inspiration for Silverstein's song was the radio personality and author Gene, that's J-E-A-N, Shepherd, who frequently complained about being teased as a boy for his name. But the name Sue itself came from Sue Hicks, a judge whose name Silverstein may have encountered when they were both visiting the resort town of Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Remember, that's where Sue in the song finally catches up with his father. Earlier in his career, though, Sue Hicks was, along with his brother Herbert, one of the city attorneys in Dayton, Tennessee, as well as a close friend of Scopes. They used to double date, and later one of his prosecutors. Unlike his counterpart in the song, though, he was named Sue not to toughen him up, but in the memory of his mother, who died shortly after his birth. He became a judge in 1936 and was on the bench for 22 years. In 1970, Johnny Cash mailed him two record albums and two pictures, autographed with, To Sue, How Do You Do? <laughs> That's great. Um, so we have another Scopes trial question then. Um, Bruce Wiley asks, is it true that Scope's defense team also included a librarian who is a biblical authority and modernist Unitarian minister, Charles Potter? Uh, Potter was, I mean, in the sense that he was a lined up as an expert witness, Potter was involved. And I think he consulted with the, um, uh, the legal team. I mean, he wasn't part of the legal team since he wasn't a lawyer. Yes, that's, I believe that's correct. Uh, it's, so the Scopes trial was one of the uh, many trials over the teaching of evolution that did not involve expert witnesses, although they wanted, to, wanted it to, at least the, the defense did. They had lined up a bunch of scientists and uh, clergy to give testimony, which the judge um, said was irrelevant. Uh, they got it all read into the record uh, so that the appeals court could consider it. But mainly because Jan 
uh, John Randolph Neal, who the local council was handling the appeal, messed up the paperwork. Uh, they were not able to include it in the appeal record. So uh, there was actually a, a bad error on the part of the defense team. Oh dear. Um, Stuart Wamsley has a question about one of your graphs. Um, in the uh, evolution statement, I'm sorry, on the graph you showed, um, okay, I'm just gonna read the question instead of trying to paraphrase. <laughs> Was there data to suggest that the increase in Americans believing in the evolution statement on the graph you showed accounted for by more, more by the reduction in not sure answers? In other words, are the reject people Im immovable? So we can convince the ones who aren't sure, we can't convince the ones who. Yeah, from that particular survey, no, because I don't think it also, I don't think that survey also asked questions about people's uh, religious attitudes. Uh, I think there is evidence from other surveys that does suggest that the rise of the nuns uh, is contributing to um, the um, increase in evolution acceptance, but not exclusively. But we need more data on this. Um, I'm just looking through for to see what additional. Um, I I think we might have answered all the questions. We okay. we do have we do have one um, one. Uh, person who would like to know Gordon Gam, um, that he celebrates Darwin Day by going to a costume store, renting a gorilla suit, and then his wife greets his guests uh, at the door by telling them that a relative is uh, visiting from out of town. That's cute. Uh, someone submitted a question before the talk about uh, China, which I, I could address. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I, I, the question was um, asking about uh, the theory that there are sort of two, um, that, that, that there was a line of evolution from Asia that's different from the line of evolution from Africa. Yeah, so we, we see this in some work by Chinese scientists that who are kind of unhappy at the idea of a African ancestry of human beings do reading between the lines because of uh, anti-African racism. And um, the, I'd say that these ideas are not creationism proper, but sort of a cousin. They involve rejecting a portion of established science uh, owing to ideological reasons, sure. But here the ideology is primarily religious, but racist. And the alternative to the rejected scientific explanation doesn't involve the supernatural. So I'd compare this line of thinking more to racial supremacist and ethno-nationalist misunderstandings of misrepresentations of archeology span and paleoanthropology, such as we see in the Christian identity movement in the US or the BJP and the RSS in India. Of course, those can also be associated with religious ideas as they are with Christian identity and the BJP. So this takes a little sorting out. As far as I'm aware, there have only been three surveys or series of surveys of the general Chinese uh, population about their acceptance of evolution. The results vary somewhat, but generally clock in around two thirds plus or minus accepting evolution. So that's a bit higher than the uh, general US population, which sometimes but doesn't reliably reach that mark depending on the exact survey. There was an interesting uh, recent paper in Public Understanding of Science by Zhang et al, which compared a sample of co Chinese college students and a sample of US college graduates, finding a highly a significantly higher level of acceptance of evolution in the Chinese sample than the US sample, but no significant differences in their average levels of understanding of evolution. So in the terms I've been using, this suggests that ideology plays a role in blocking the usual route from understanding to acceptance in the US sample, but not in the Chinese sample. And given the longstanding official hostility to religion in China, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I take this as confirmation. Fascinating. Um, so it, it's a, a good thing that we're out of questions because we are also out of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much for, for this fascinating um, 
talk, uh, evolution and, uh, and how it's taught in, in our schools is always uh, of great interest to our audience. So yeah. thank, thank you so, thank much, so much for, for joining me.